Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit iBethel.org. We're going to read a couple portions of Scripture. We'll start with Exodus 33. And uh, we're actually today, uh, we're going to focus on two portions of Scripture that in some ways have had, uh, I hate to say the most influence, but certainly at the top uh, influence in my life, in my thinking over the last 20 years. And um, let me give you just a, a little bit of background. First of all, I, I, uh, I felt uh, towards the end of December, uh, around Christmas time, I really felt like the Lord spoke to me and said that this next year, 2018, the year that we're in now, would be a year of new beginnings. And uh, really felt the Lord on that. Uh, Benny and I went to Korea. We actually spent New Year's a little. It was a mistake in my schedule, um, in my scheduling. But, uh, but it ended up, I think, being a God mistake. And it was a glorious time in Korea with some friends. And then a conference that I <clears throat> do every year with Cheon. And this year, one of the guest speakers was uh, Chuck Pierce, who is a great prophet of the Lord and a good friend. Really, really love that guy. Just a real pure stream. Anyway, he gets up to speak one of the nights, and he, and he starts talking about that this year is the year of new beginnings. And uh, so I, I, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the message that I have for you today. It just needs to be said. It's a year of new beginnings, uh, and there's, I think there's a whole bunch of things probably represented in the room that you just as soon see start over. And, uh, and I feel like it's a year for that, where the Lord is just going to just add a freshness to things, new life to things, and new beginnings. So... That, uh, that is this next year. This, uh, these last few weeks have been very, very tender for me. I, uh, many times throughout the day, whether I'm at home, whether I'm in the corporate gathering here or conference or in Korea or the Randy Clark event this last week, I feel like I'm about this far away from tears almost all the time, but it's never sadness. It's just the unexplainable kind that I'm just, I'm overwhelmed by what I see God doing. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, for example, again, this last week, we saw the beautiful testimony of PTSD healed. And uh, Randy has a guy on his team now that has personally led 10,000 people into healing of PTSD. It's, it's one of the most extraordinary things. I mean, it is, it is literally, it's just off the charts. They're now bringing him to military bases and places where it's it's, it's running so rampant that they need help, and there's no answers, but Jesus is the answer. And, he, and, and we watch people. In fact, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to remember the next couple of weeks if I remember to, to show you just a, a testimony of one of the miracles that actually happened here in Reading and was r- towards the beginning of this launch uh, for them and seeing this, this horrible affliction of the heart um, healed. And uh, so you watch this happen. You know, you watch, you know, the gal, they showed the video of the gal that has this metal uh, bar put in her arm and you see the picture of how this thing stood out and they prayed and it literally just went in, just, just dissolved. And you, you, you know, your, your mind cannot commute what God, com- compute what God is doing, but he just literally just reduces that and just completely heals and restores it. The stories go on and on and on. I mean, they're just extraordinary, extraordinary things. But it's all symbolic in a sense of not the season we're in because that's been going on for years. But there's a, there's a, a presence. There was, this week was filled. I don't know if everybody experienced this, but I, I know the ones that I interacted with about this. There was, such, there was such a sense of God's presence in the building that it just felt like anything was possible at any time. And I just became mindful of, of something that I wanted to share with you today. And all of this, uh, actually, I'm going to probably combine like three different concepts or three different uh, teachings or messages that I, that I run with and put them into one and basically boil it down to this. We are stewards of the divine. We are stewards. Yeah. We're stewards of the testimony of God. We're stewards of the ways of God. We're stewards of the presence of God. It's those three things. And you probably could ask, we could add a hundred things to the list. But to me, those three things represent the bulk of why we are on planet earth and what we have the privilege doing with our lives. Stewards of the testimony. Stewards of the knowledge of his ways. And stewards of his presence. You know, the great revelation 
that Jesus provided in coming to earth, to putting on flesh, was he was revealed as Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. The whole, the whole point of Jesus coming to earth was, was so that humanity, so that people could actually discover that God is with us. He is so for us that he is with us. And it, it's, uh, it's tragic to me to watch people day after day, week after week, year after year of their lives live this far from the answer and be clueless to God has brought that within arm's reach. The Lord Jesus gives us a gift and repent is, is the gift of repentance. Uh, repentance is not something that we uh, just randomly choose whenever we want. It's literally a gift. The Bible calls repentance a gift that God gives. And it's a part of what he does in wooing us to himself. Repentance isn't just the, uh, a mourning over our past. It, it includes that. It's, but it's the sorrow of our sin that is so deep in its impact that it launches us into a shift in how we think about life, how we think about sin, how we think about a present, our future. All of that is contained in this wonderful gifted word called repentance. And so Jesus gives us access to steward these three parts or aspects of God's person, his nature. It's the testimony, it's the ways of God, it's the presence of God. The Bible is filled with, uh, uh, I don't want to call them lists, but they're principles that come in sequence. For example, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, I will enter his courts, so it's deeper into the presence, with praise. So throughout scripture, there, there are these processes that he takes us through where there's, there's deliberate shifts in priorities, in activities, in actions, in the way that we think, how we apply truth. There's these, these places that we come to where there's, there's this shift where we say, you know what, I'm not just interested in the works of God. I want to know what he's like. I want to know his ways. And the scripture says Israel was acquainted with the acts of God, but Moses was acquainted with his ways. That's a huge shift there because Israel missed out on what Moses had. But the implication of scripture was they all had access to it. They all had access. But Israel was acquainted with man on the ground every morning. They were, they were acquainted. They were satisfied with water out of the rock. They, they never made it past the act of God on their behalf into discovering the nature of God. And here's the saddest part of that equation. Whenever God reveals something about his nature, whenever he reveals, he unveils, here is something about his nature. Whenever he unveils that part of his nature, it always comes with the invitation to know him in that way. Never does the understanding of his nature Never does it come to us just, make it, just to make us more theologically sound. That's important, but it is secondary. What's important is to know him in that way, to encounter him. So when he says, I'm your provider, I don't want to walk away from that revelation without provision. You know, when he, when he says, I am your holiness, I, I, don't, you know, I don't want to walk away the same that I came in. I, I want to leave change because I have encountered him. And now relationally, I come to know him in that way. So his ways, you know, let's say he healed your body this week, uh, his way. So he heals your body. But what happens is we become this, this thing that God is doing in us is so provoking and stirring us that we no longer become satisfied with just the act of God. God, show me what you're like. And so now, instead of me just being satisfied with a healing, I want to discover the healer. So the healing points to his nature, the healer. So now there's this relationship with the God who is my health. See, he heals not as an act, so to speak. Follow my train of thought here. It's who he is. He cannot not be the healer. He cannot not be the provider. He, can't, he, it's, he cannot choose to not be that because it's, it's his person. It's his nature. It's his makeup. He provides because of his nature. It's out of who he is that he does all these things. 
And so here he invites us constantly into being exposed to the works of God. We, we, we see these extraordinary works of God in our life. We hear of the miracle of provision. We hear of the promotion that somebody got. Sometimes it's such the simplest thing and sometimes it's the most crazy, bizarre thing, but we see these things that God does and we become unsettled with just standing back and giving a golf clap for a miracle that God has just done or a testimony that's given. We become provoked inside. I must know this one who does this on behalf of humanity. He does this in people's hearts. I must know this father who took this guy, we saw the video this week if you were there, who was locked up in PTSD, absolutely unable to function normally in life, and in literally in moments completely transform his life to where he's never been able to play with his children, he's never been able to you know, take on the pressures of life, of work, and all these things, and now suddenly, overnight, he's completely different and changed. It was no magic wand. It was a person called Jesus who stepped into his life and just sorted things out. So we see this and we go, you know, I don't have PTSD, but I got stuff. And I got to know this one who settles these issues. And so we look at the sign as an invitation to know the one who is like that and to make him known. Here's the verse that I want us to read. It's here in Exodus 33. It's verse 13. He says, uh, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace or favor in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you, that I might find grace in your sight. Consider that this nation is your people. Go back to at least what for me uh, is the heart of this verse. Show me your way that I might know you. Say that with me. Show me your ways that I might know you. Say it again. Show me your ways that I might know you. What's the point? The point is the testimony reveals the nature. The nature is the invitation to an encounter. But in the encounter, we come to know the one who works wonders. Once you see what the sign points to, you're never satisfied with only a sign again. You hear about this wonderful restaurant and you drive looking for it and you see the sign. You don't turn around and go home. You go to where the sign is pointing. The the sign points to something greater than itself. It's like the exit sign over the door. It's real but it points to something more real. That's the exit. So you see the miracle of healing or deliverance, whatever it may be, the healing of a marriage, the prospering of a business. It's a sign, but it takes you to a person. And the whole purpose of this journey is to know him. Israel stopped short. They were satisfied with miracles. Miracles do become boring. Look at Israel. Manna every day. After a while, what else is on the menu? I mean, the creation of food before them every day. After a while, boy, we'd sure like some meat. Which I understand that one. (laughs) Just between you and me, meat is vital part of life. And I'll leave that. (laughs) Let me know your ways that I might know you. Turn with me to the um, book of Mark and we'll read where we're going to land today. Uh, Mark chapter 8 is a uh, a portion of scripture. I don't know, maybe I, I have taught on this here more than any other portion. It wouldn't surprise me if that was true. And the reason for that is uh, it it takes me a long time to learn things. 
And I, I, I will open to the story on somewhat of a regular basis and review the story and specifically one particular verse because I need, I need to face the questions that Jesus asks. He asks certain questions. You, you've heard it before, but whenever God is asking you a question, it's never because he's lacking information. He's just trying to dial something up in you that you don't know is there, or he's trying to lead you into understanding something. And so he asks these questions, and they're, they're, they're provoking questions. We'll get to them in a moment. But if you picture this with me, the Jesus, uh, the disciples have a three-and-a-half-year relational journey with Jesus. And during this time, they've watched things happen uh, that, that just change their, their thinking about life in general. They, they all, uh, you know, were pretty insignificant people from politicians to fishermen to whatever. And they, they, just, they just suddenly caught a vision for their life and were willing to die for something. Uh, previous to that, they just wanted to catch fish. But now suddenly they're wanting to change the world. And they, did, they, they caught that by being with this Jesus. And Jesus would use them. He would, he would empower them to do the same things he did. It had to be absolutely frightening and glorious all at the same time. And it's kind of funny because Jesus would use them so powerfully that they actually began to think they were important outside of their role. They, they began to think of their own significance in a, in a strange way. You know, like they'd argue as to who was the, the greatest. You know, we, we're too smart to argue with each other. I'm greater than you. No, I'm better than you. We, we, we're way too religious to do that. We just do that by pointing to somebody else's flaws. It's, it's the more subtle way of saying I'm better than you. <clears throat> anyway, let's stop meddling and move on here. <clears throat> But the disciples, what did Jesus do? He immersed them in this atmosphere of presence and power, used them in significance in a glorious way, the way he had designed for them to live. But in doing so, it dialed up stuff in their hearts that they didn't know was there. Peter was shocked to find out he would deny the Lord. He was absolutely convinced he would last when everybody else fell. And yet he was the one who denied Jesus. What happens? In these moments where where there's pressure. Pressure isn't always negative, but pressure isn't always added because of problems. Sometimes pressure is added because of the miraculous, of the way God uses us, because of the understanding we receive. There's, there's just this stuff that comes on our life, and the weightiness of God's work in us reveals fractures. It doesn't cause fractures, it reveals fractures. Why? The Lord never does that to shame us. He never does that as punishment. He always does it so that we can see what he sees. Because if I can see what he sees, then I can confess. And confession basically means to agree with God. So the weightiness of God's work in my life reveals a fracture. Maybe it's a fracture in my thinking. Every time I get in this pressure situation, I just start criticizing myself. Or every time I get in this pressure situation, I want to withdraw from people. Or every time I get in this pressure situation, I blame other people around me instead of taking responsibility. Whatever it might be, that weightiness of whether it's blessing or whether it's responsibility, it reveals fractures. Why? It's so that I can come into agreement with God. I see that, Lord. I see that I have that tendency to beat myself up when this pressure comes. Please forgive me because I believe things about me you don't believe about me, and it's got to change. What is he doing? He's in his mercy. He's revealing fractures so that we can come into agreement because once we see it and we come into agreement, the confession releases the capacity to forsake. It's uh, that was really good news right there. The confession, I see it. Oh God, I beat myself up every time this pressure comes. I'm tired of it. I, I, I know you revealed that so that I confess it. I agree with you. There's a fracture in my makeup that blames me for everything. And I know it's not right. And I'm confessing my self-centeredness because don't think it's anything other than you blame you every time something is wrong. It's still, it's a, it's a reverse arrogance and pride. Face it, call it for what it is, because I'm still the fo focus of my attention. God, please forgive me for this subtle pride that has robbed me of so many things in my life. I'm through with it. I'm finished with it. And by your grace, I step into thinking differently about me now because of what you said over me. So there's that, that confession. We forsake 
He actually releases in the confession the divine capacity to forsake, to leave what has trailed behind you all this time. That's the reason for the weightiness of God. So the disciples in this journey had two occasions where they were privileged to see food multiply and feed thousands of people. One time they, they fed 5,000 men besides women and children, another time 4,000 men besides women and children. I think it's important to know, to recognize, even though it's not the subject of the message today, it's important to recognize that before the death and resurrection of Christ, before the day of Pentecost, only the men were counted, counted in a crowd. A crowd was measured by how many men were there. The women were there, they were fed in these miracles, but they weren't, in, they weren't counted. After the day of Pentecost, men, women, and children were counted. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit creates a level playing field. And it's, it's, it's vital that we recognize that grace that is released over the church, where we find every race, we find every uh, economic uh, level, we find every age, all, it's a level playing field. Read in Joel 2 about the outpouring of the Spirit. It becomes a level playing field through the outpouring of the Spirit. But back to the story here. The disciples are with Jesus on two occasions where they see food multiply, and they were used in the miracle. And uh, they would distribute the food, and it literally would, would increase as they passed it out. Jesus didn't throw the boys lunch in the air and go shazam and create a pile of food. Instead, he, he, he divided it into 12 sections, and the disciples took it out and fed the multitudes. Extraordinary miracle. We're going to, we're going to look at the disciples the day after. All right, so they got major miracle, 4,000 men besides women and children, extraordinary time. They get in a boat, they're going on a journey, they get some R&R time with Jesus, and they're in the boat. All right, you with me? Longest introduction ever, but we're there. All right, verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to take bread. Actually, let's start with 13. He left them, getting into the boat, left them, meaning the crowd, getting in the boat again, departed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to take bread. They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? I will actually turn to verse 17, uh, just randomly on my own, because those questions are piercing to me and they expose my, my leaning into thinking differently than Jesus. And to me, the prize of all prizes for us right now is the mind of Christ. It is the great prize. It is the reward of repentance. It is the fruit or the result of repentance, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is the great prize. I mean, we celebrate the presence, obviously. There's no greater gift than the presence of God, Emmanuel, God with us. We celebrate the anointings, that manifestation of presence that brings miracles and healing, deliverance, all this stuff. We celebrate one another. We celebrate so many things that God has given us. But there is one thing that is more transformational than any other, and that is the mind of Christ. It's seeing and thinking the way he sees and the way he thinks. There's something different about... Jesus, who can look at a boy's lunch fearlessly, knowing that there's going to be leftovers. There's going to be more than enough. This is going to be such a wonderful moment that we will have more at the end than what we started with. But that was the thinking. He, we, we know there's an oak tree in an acorn. Well, in circumstances that would come up, he would see the possibility, the potential of a moment. That divine reasoning... You know, I get there eventually. I don't always start there. In fact, just between you and me, don't tell anyone this. It seems like I hardly ever start there. I get there, but starting with his perception is a gift that I long for. You know, I know that biblically we have the mind of Christ. By the way, it says we have, it doesn't say I have. It's collectively. We, our Father, we have the mind of Christ. But anyway, I know that we have the mind of Christ, but I, I, want, I want 
what's in my account to be in my possession. In other words, I, I want it to influence my, my initial reaction. I, I get there, but I want my initial reaction to be mind of Christ. And I do believe that that's the, the, great, uh, the great prize. So he says, take heed, verse 15, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. He's not warning them about bad bread. You know, he's not saying, don't go to Herod's bakery because it's bad. Don't go to the Pharisees, you know, stay away from their bread. He's warning them about ways of thinking. The way you perceive reality can be shaped by these two themes, these two groups. And these two actually... Um, clarify the two primary movements in the earth apart from the kingdom of God. There's the leaven of the kingdom, there's the leaven of Herod, there's the leaven of the Pharisees. Those are three different perceptions of reality. And so Jesus, you know, imagine yourself sitting in the boat, you, you've, been, you've just had the most incredible day of your life yesterday, you're in the boat going to the other side, you have a little interaction time with Jesus and just kind of enjoying the journey and Jesus says, hey guys, let me have your attention. And you look towards him, you're waiting to hear another more pearls of wisdom and he says, be careful of the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. And, and they all go, did you bring the bread? because they thought he was actually rebuking them because they forgot somebody dropped their responsibility. And they look around the boat and they don't have any bread. And Jesus, of course, is not talking about Herod's bakery or the Pharisee's bakery. He's, He's talking about perception of reality that becomes shaped by a value system that is other than the kingdom of God. It's, it's, it's counterfeit perception. It's, it's anchoring our hearts into the inferior instead of living from the reality of God's rule, his dominion towards the circumstances of life. And every believer has the amazing privilege of living from heaven towards earth. That's the call. That's the privilege of God. That's what it is to abide in Christ. So here we have this warning. Be careful of the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. Herod represents the political system. It's humanistic in nature. It does not mind you believing in God. Just don't bring that into the everyday affairs of life. In other words, it's okay that you confess to be a Christian. It's all right. Just don't bring him into the political office. Don't bring him into the classroom. It's the humanistic. It's man at the center of everything. And man as God is a real letdown. The Pharisees' leaven is not any better because while it believes in God, he's impersonal and powerless. It's in form, it's in shape, it's in ritual, it's in routine, it's not in relationship. It's not anchored in knowing, it's not anchored in encountering. It's just this routine that we follow. And so Jesus says, don't fall into either of these two ditches. This ditch here will kill you. It's called humanism. And this ditch will kill you. It's called religious routine and form without relationship. Both of these things are dangerous and they're both cancers to your soul. Be careful of these things. And he's warning them and they completely miss it. He asks them these questions and this is what I review on a somewhat of a regular basis. Verse 17, why do you reason because you have no bread? Why does your reasoning start with what you don't have? Why does your reasoning start with what you don't have? Why? Why? Why, why are you doing that? <laughs> you can just see, I, I feel like I'm in the boat, to be honest with you. Often I feel like, yeah, I, I need you to ask me those questions again. <laughs> you know, why do you reason that you have no bread? Um, is it because we have no bread? <laughs> Somehow I know that's the wrong answer, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> and he says, how is it that you don't pe- perceive or understand? I don't know. (laughs) He says, is your heart still hardened? That's the third question. Is your heart still hardened? I didn't know it was, but apparently it is. (laughs) He just takes it through these questions. And all he's trying to do is expose the fracture so that we can make agreement and see things healed and changed. See, when you've experienced supernatural supply, I'll ask you the question. How many of you have had God provide for you in an absolute supernatural way? 
all of us have. How many of you, after you experienced that supernatural provision, you had another financial problem? (laughs) How many of you were as afraid and as nervous the second time as you were the first time? That's the point, is that I learned nothing. It was, it was like, it was like I, know he, I know he provided, he's so good, he took care of me last time, but the, the problem that I'm facing right now, I don't know if he's gonna do it again. You know, it's just that Russian roulette thing. I just happened to hit the right cylinder and I got the answer of God, but you know, he just doesn't always work like that. And I don't know, I may be on my own. It could be that I earned this mess and, 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 and I approve my devotion by just sucking it up and bear up under the pressure of this financial thing. And he's, he's, he's looking at us like, don't, you don't understand what forgiveness is, huh? So, so he asked this series of questions. He says, so why do you reason that you have no bread? Because once you've experienced the miracle of God's provision, you've lost the right to begin any thought process with what you don't have. That is not brought into the equation. It fascinates me that in these two stories that Jesus didn't create food out of nothing. I mean, he could have, but that wasn't the miracle. The miracle was that he took what there was and he multiplied it. Let's look at the rest of the story here. Verse 18, having eyes do you not see, having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? That verse has helped me so much. Let me tell you why. He's asking the questions again, and I need the questions of Jesus. So he says, having eyes do you not see? And you know, I'll be really honest, I'm in a whole bunch of situations throughout my average week or month where no, I'm, I'm totally clueless. I don't see at all what you're doing. I'm I'm, I don't know. It's not working. It's just not working. So he follows up with the second question. He says, well, can you hear? Well, the reality is I do hear better than I see. And so he follows the second question. He says, can you hear? And there I'm in situations where I go, nope, I hate to say it, but I don't see and I don't hear. And so he follows with the next one. And I'm so thankful for it. He says, well, do you remember? Yeah. You want to activate your hearing? Meditate on what you remember of the works of God. Review the activities of God. I don't care if you have to go back to the days of Moses, or you have to go back to your parents and grandparents, or you have to go back to last week. Go back to something that you watch God do. Don't just take it at surface level. God, show me the nature of a father would cause that metal bar in the arm to dissolve that would take a son that was so tormented by combat uh, uh, fatigue on his heart, his mind, that you would heal him in moments where he thinks clearly and he now contributes to the well-being of his family. Show me what kind of father you are because I'm afraid I could just see the surface and never tap into the heartbeat of a father who loves people like you do. God, take me beyond the obvious. Take me beyond the obvious. Let, let this memory activate my hearing because I want to hear better. And what I've noticed is that remembering activates my hearing and hearing activates my seeing. And so he asks some more questions. He says, verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take out? And he said, seven. And he said, how is it you don't understand? I don't know. <laughs> Look what he just did. He just he, he asked him about the numbers of people they fed. So 5,000 and 4,000. What did they start with? They started with five loaves and another time seven loaves. So when they fed the larger group, 5,000 people, they started with fewer loaves five loaves instead of seven, and they had more leftovers, 12. When they started with more, the seven loaves, they fed a smaller crowd and had fewer leftovers, seven baskets. It's divine math. (laughs) Why did God choose Israel? He said, because they were the least. Don't be surprised that he chooses to work in a way where he receives the most glory. And when you start thinking you're pretty cool because God chose you. (laughs) 
Just remember. I love a statement Sean Bowles made. I don't know when he made it, but I read it last year sometime. And it goes something like this. He said, the Lord makes sure that all of our friends, our closest friends, sees our idiosyncrasies and our broken areas of life and the things that don't always work well in us. And make sure that our closest friends see that so that when God uses us, all, they all know it's by the grace of God. <laughs> so they all know it's by the grace of God. And that's the reason many people will not come close in a relationship because they don't want anyone to know that. And when they do it, they withhold glory from God because people never really discover how much that work was by the grace of God. You see, these miracles that they were exposed to was supposed to have a greater effect on them. This, this won't sound right probably, but give me a moment. It was to have a greater effect on them than merely inspiring them to give God praise. Now, I buy into that completely. I, I love us responding to God's works and giving him the honor, giving him the credit. He was looking for more. He was looking for their history with him feeding 5,000, feeding 4,000. He was, he was looking for their history with him to become the lenses through which they see their present situation. He was looking for them to be so impacted by the multiplying of food that when he starts talking to them about leaven, they don't go into a fear mode about what they don't have. Their initial response is instead, I serve the God of the impossible. He did it before, he'll do it again. I mentioned all of that this morning because I, I felt so strongly in, in getting ready for today that the, the reminder perhaps of what we steward, what we actually give oversight to, what we take charge of in our own lives, that we steward the testimony of the Lord. We steward, we, we, we remember. We, we've been trying harder and harder as a staff to write these things down. To, we've hired someone to record them. We now have a team that uh, does background uh, research to get medical verification. And, and we've got a great story we're gonna show you. Uh, Bethlehem Media is working on right now that we'll be able to show you in a couple of weeks of one of the most extraordinary miracles that we've ever seen. And uh, medical evidence, medical proof of, of, this, of this miracle. So we, we, we want this. We want to be accurate. We want to collect things that really, truly bring God glory. But they have to be more than the moments in our life together where we just simply applaud and give God thanks for what he's done. But we actually see to where the sign's pointing. Come to know a father who treats a son that's been so destroyed through combat in moments. He makes it as though he was never in a war where there's such peace on his mind, his heart. is that kind of a father. Wow. It's going beyond just the testimony so we can cheer. It's, it's coming to know this one who knows no limitation, no restriction, no restraint. He is absolutely full on in demonstrating his love for us. So we steward the testimony. And it's important that we hold to it as a treasure. We steward the knowledge of his ways, what is he like? Because there's a lot of people out there, you know, let's be honest, we're the ones who taught the insurance companies to call hurricanes and floods acts of God. They got their theology from the church. Let's teach him something new this next season of what he's like as a father, that he's the one who heals, he's the one who restores, he's the one who protects, he's the one who delivers not just as a point of theology, but out of her own rich experience with a father who loves us so tenderly and so carefully. So I steward testimony and I steward the knowledge of his ways. But the greatest gift of all is I steward his presence, he who has chosen to identify himself with me. I close with this thought. Moses asked the Lord at the beginning of his call, God called him to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And Moses asked this great question. He said, who am I? God said, I'll be with you. And I, I, don't, I don't know, if I'm Moses, I'm going, that's awesome. 
but you skipped my question. (laughs) Who am I? Certainly I will be with you. Mm. All right. I, I, used to, I used to think God just, in fact, I taught it. God just ignored his question because he had something better to show him, which, which in part is true. But what did he actually tell Moses? How did he, let's look at it this way. Who was Moses? God says, you're the one I want to be with. That's who you are. Your identity is in the one who has chosen to walk with you. That's who you are. You are the one over whom God says, I am not ashamed to be called their God. That's who you are. You are the one I am not ashamed to display myself upon. That's who you are. I do love the privilege of being together and I especially love the opportunity to make sure that everyone in the room has an opportunity to know what it is to be forgiven of sin, to turn from the self-centered lifestyle that everybody lives before meeting Jesus, to turn from that one thing that condemns every one of us, and that is sin. There's only one possible solution. God made this statement. He says, there's only one name under heaven by which a person must be saved. It's foolish to think there's many ways to God. Foolish, absolute foolishness. If there's many ways to God, then he was cruel to Jesus to make him suffer and die the way he did. If there was any other way to get people to be at peace with God, then that was absolute cruelty. It was done because it was the only possible solution. There had to be the shedding of innocent blood for the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus volunteered to die in my place, your place. And with a crowd this size, there's always opportunity. There's always a chance that there are people here that have never said yes to Jesus. You've never said, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to turn from my life. I want to know what it is to be forgiven. I know what, want to know what it is to be born again. And if that's anybody in the room, just quickly, I want you right where you are sitting, just put a hand up. And we're just going to make wonderful, wonderful agreement with you that you would know what it is to be forgiven of sin to be brought into the kingdom of God, to be adopted into God's family. Wait about 15 seconds. That's about it, 10 seconds maybe. But if there's anyone at all, please put your hand up. If you're in the overflow room, please do it there so the people there can see you. Is there a hand up? I didn't see it. I'm sorry. Is it right over here? Yes, right there. Yeah, wonderful. I bless you, sir, in Jesus' name. I bless you. Anyone else? Real quickly. Anyone else? All right, let's go ahead and stand. If you'd hold your places, please. I, I, uh, it will help us tremendously if you, if you would give opportunity for this to happen. I, I want, this is what I want. I want ministry team to quickly come to the front. The gentleman that put your hand up, if you wouldn't mind, do us all a favor, yourself a favor, come down here. I want you to talk and to pray with the people to my left. There's a banner over here. It's called a freedom banner. And it, it just is a place where some folks that we know and love uh, will help you. Now, the rest of you, as the ministry team is coming, just put hands in front of you. I just want to pray over you concerning this mind of Christ. In fact, maybe I should have you lay hands on one another's head. No, don't do that. Shake it to let's, let's just pray together. I want to pray for this mind of Christ thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris and to Tom. And uh, if you would hold your places, please. It's very important that we give place to what the Holy Spirit is doing first and foremost. So, Father, I ask for the glory of the name Jesus, that you would help us to adjust and shift with everything you do so that we see the beautiful opportunities to know you, to love you, and to make you known. We devote ourselves as stewards of testimony, the knowledge of your ways, and your presence. I ask for this grace to rest more powerfully on us this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org.
Thank you.